Good evening, everyone. My name is Melissa Hosick. I'm the adult programming librarian at the East Brunswick Public Library. Thank you for coming out to tonight's presentation on keeping your child safe on the internet with Officer Reginald Wright of the East Brunswick Community Policing Unit. He will be doing a presentation. Um, if you have questions, you can put them in Q&A or in the chat and I will read them out to him. And this is gonna be a little bit more informal. If there's lots of questions and topics that come up, please feel free to ask and he will do his best to answer. So thank you, officer, and welcome. Thank you. All right, well, good evening, everyone. As you mentioned, my name is uh, Officer Wright of the East Brunswick Police Department. I work in Community and Policing Unit, which falls under the Police Administration Division. Uh, this evening's presentation, as she mentioned, is going to be on internet safety. So at any point, if you have any questions, please uh, type your questions into the chat and I'll do my best to answer uh, your questions based on my training and experience. All right, so let's begin. <clears throat> okay, so welcome. Uh, for most of us as parents, I myself have a 11 year old son. Um, we are first generation in terms of internet parents. So that may or may not be true for those that have tuned in, um, but for someone like myself, this is true. Uh, my son is being, he's being raised um, with the internet um, as part of his everyday life. Obviously kids today have Chromebooks as part of their school curriculum in regards to how they do their work in school um, and some in regards to how they do their, their homework as well and take their tests. Um, so our children tend to know more about the internet than we do, especially at a very young age. <clears throat> the goals for tonight is to understand what our children are doing online, um, to keep our children safe when they're online, to teach our children to make smart choices when they're online, um, to start a discussion about internet safety <clears throat> that we continue with our families and others beyond tonight. Um, how children get online, um, I think this is obvious for some of us, but some may be unaware. Um, mobile devices, which is cell phones, excuse me, laptops, um, Chromebooks, ThinkPads, personal computers, desktops, um, video game consoles, Xbox, PlayStation, um, whatever gaming system is out there. What do children do online? Um, they go into a virtual world. They visit virtual worlds. Um, they play multi-user games, um, also known as online gaming. Um, they, post, they post profiles of themselves. Um, they interact with others um, via social networking sites. They also view and post videos of themselves, whether it's them like TikTok, for example, or just maybe videos of themselves playing video games. They download movies, uh, they download music and much more. Um, they create and upload art. And then of course, children do research online. Popular virtual worlds, um, as you can see, those three are the, the top three. Now, I don't know if this is still true to this day. Um, this was back in 2010 when this uh, research was done. Um, but obviously these are three of the well-known. Um, some are better than others. Um, children go on these websites to visit. They also have parental controls, which can restrict these sites. Um, that's what you would like. In addition to that, they have parental, parental controls that also restrict their use of such things like YouTube um, on your television, as well as on your laptop, just FYI. Popular, popular social networking sites, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat. Obviously, when kids go onto these uh, networking sites, they create profiles, they communicate with friends, and they tend to find people with similar interests. Texting and instant messaging. These allow children to talk with friends at any time on the computer or the cell phone. Texting and instant messaging has replaced emails as a preferred method of communication. In addition to this, they also obviously have like Instagram, Snapchat, and various other apps as well. The WhatsApp, there's Viber, there's different apps out there which students tend to use to communicate with each other. Video sharing, um, this is also popular. Uh, YouTube being one of the ones that most people know, Facebook, you know, Snapchat. Um, users view and post videos post and read comments about the video content. This is obviously a big one. Um, students seem to be uh, very interested in what other people are doing. 
So video sharing is something that uh, has become very popular in today's, today's times. Online gaming, consoles like Xbox Live are increasingly connected to the internet, allowing kids to play against friends and strangers. That's something to keep in mind, um, that there are people that they will sometimes connect with that are strangers that they have no idea um, who this individual or individuals are. Many allow players to talk in real time using headsets and microphones. Kids may be exposed to trash talk or worse. Online concerns. Obviously, cyberbullying is a concern of disturbing content, stuff that is not appropriate um, for their age, depending on how old they may be, viruses, spyware, and sexual predators, unfortunately. Cyberbullying. Uh, Cyberbullying is posting or forwarding a private text or embarrassing image to others, tricking someone into revealing embarrassing information and forwarding it to others, spreading malicious rumors and stealing passwords. And unfortunately, this does happen. Protecting against cyberbullying. This is something that is very important. Um, never respond to unkind remarks. Do not, not participate in cyberbullying. Block the cyberbully. Tell a trusted adult, save the post. Do not delete the post, save the post. Um, notify law enforcement if it's appropriate and notify your child's school if that is appropriate as well. Um, inappropriate content. There are bad parts of the internet just as there are bad parts of town, so. Just like anything else in life, anything that is good, um, there's some bad, there's pros and cons to, to everything. Um, the way that we can shield our children or shield your child is with parental control software. So there is software that can be utilized um, to actually try to help alleviate or minimize um, inappropriate content. Um, there's child-friendly search engines. Um, there's bookmarks to favorite sites. Um, and always as you know, parents or guardians or caregivers, we wanna teach um, our children or your child what to do um, if they accidentally view disturbing content. Malicious files. Um, your computer may become infected with viruses and, and spyware through downloads. Um, emails obviously is a big one. People send phishing emails out. Peer-to-peer um, -peer networking and and affected uh, websites. Sexual predators, they masquerade as other children or kindly, kind, pretty much kind adults. So they'll, they'll try to figure out what are kids into, what are kids like, um, as the second point mentions, to, to literally trick them, um, trick them into revealing themselves, revealing personal information. That information could be where they live, where they go to school, where their parents work or parents, guardians or caregivers work, um, if they're home alone, if they're home alone at a certain time of the day, any, any kind of personal information they can get, these predators will try to trick children into revealing and providing that. Um, they will lure children and teenagers into meeting them in person. Keep your personal information private. Never reveal name, address, phone number or school name. So essentially you never want to tell someone that's, that's a stranger or someone that you truly do not know personally, any of your personal information. And don't post or send photographs of yourself. Once that, those photographs, once that information is out there in the quote unquote cyber world, you can't get it back. Even with apps like Snapchat, you know, students tend to think, okay, it's only on the screen for a certain period of time and then it's going to automatically erase but anyone can uh, screenshot those messages. And choose a non-descriptive screen name. So choose something that cannot necessarily be linked back to who you are, because um, otherwise people will try to use that small piece of information to dig up more information, more personal information. Learn how to use privacy settings. Become familiar with websites um, your child visits. Read privacy policies. Um, and settings should be private. So make sure that you utilize all the privacy settings 
on whatever websites that you allow your child or children to go on. If a stranger contacts your child, make sure your child knows. Uh, make sure they know to do not respond to them. Make sure they contact an adult right away and block the offender. Uh, block the offender, whether that's online, even with cell phones as well, you can block someone. You don't have to just continue to be susceptible to their messaging or harassment, whatever the case may be. Notify your internet service provider if warranted. Um, and you can notify cyber tip line as well. Basic ways to keep your child safe. You can sign an internet safety contract with your child. So you can literally lay out the parameters. This is what you're allowed to do. This is what you're not allowed to do. Um, these are the areas or the websites which you're allowed to go on. If you violate this contract, then obviously your privileges will be revoked. Um, keep the computer in a public area of your home. I've seen a lot of parents and guardians keep a computer um, in the kitchen, um, or in the living room, dining room, um, somewhere in a public area where kids know that they're being watched, that there's eyes on them. You can set a time limit for computer use. I have a friend who, actually my son, <clears throat> one of his closest friends, their parents, I think limit the amount of time on the internet for him is maybe like an hour a day or something like that. And once it reaches that hour, it just automatically just, it kicks them off. Become familiar with the sites your child is visiting. Um, you can always see the history um, of what they're visiting. Um, so make sure that you, you stay in tune with that. <clears throat> know your child's online friends, know your child's passwords, and keep your security software up to date. Basic internet rules for children. Um, so this is things that you would want to go over with your children. Never give out identifying information. Again, that's personal information. Never write or post anything you wouldn't be comfortable with the whole world seeing. Liter literally the whole world seeing. Uh, treat others online as you would treat them in person. Um, that's kind of just an old school rule. You know, treat others the way you want to be treated. Same principle. Never share your password. Never open an email or click on a link from someone you do not know that could have a virus. I never download or click anything without checking with me, meaning a parent or a trusted adult first. These are some resources. Um, Connect Safely provides tips, advice, all safe sites, the Child Safe Internet Search Engine, Common Sense Media, reviews and rates websites and other media for children according to age appropriateness and trend micro is also another one lots of information on internet safety for families uh, from trend micro uh, and that is the end of my presentation but i'm obviously here to answer some more questions because i'll go back just in case anybody have any questions about anything i'll keep it up for right now um, I've been in community policing now for almost five years. So I've seen, I've seen some of this stuff um, up close and personal in terms of some of the things we're talking about here. Uh, but I would love to hear what questions or thoughts or concerns some of you have that have tuned in. I didn't wanna have a presentation that was too long because then you'll just be listening to me. I would rather for this to be kind of interactive if possible. So if you don't, if you don't literally wanna say something please type any questions thoughts or concerns in the chat box and we can go back and forth that way so let's give them a little bit of time to type but are have there been any like really current examples of things that you've seen or patterns that you've seen recently that have been happening that might be a little bit different that you've had to address um with me personally i'm I'm pretty much in the schools full time teaching the uh, the lead curriculum, which is a character development, social emotion learning curriculum. But often I do hear teachers or parents talk about how uh, kids are dealing with cyber bullying. I'm old enough that when I was growing up, there was no internet. So bullying was just what you had to deal with in person. If someone was literally bu bullying you in school, but now those same type of actions are happening in this actual school, but they're also happening online. Um, so often, I just simply try to tell parents and guardians that you really can just block these individuals. Um, students often do not block someone that's trying to bully them or that's 
um, spreading rumors or trying to slander them for some odd reason, they don't block them. Um, also, one of the other things is, is to make sure that contract with your child, I think that's extremely important. Um, that's something that I do with my own son right here, internet safety contract. And you can just Google different internet safety contracts to kind of get a template. But that's something that I do. I think it's important for, and maybe I'm just old school, like a throwback parent, uh, but I think it's important for students to understand that this is a privilege to be able to go online, to be able to online gaming, computer games, Xbox, PlayStation, to have a cell phone. It's a privilege. Um, but my experience in the schools over the last five years is that a lot of kids think it's their right. They think like, it's my right to have a cell phone. Like, how dare you deny me the, the privilege of using, you know, my computer or my gaming system. And I try to remind parents and guardians and caregivers that unless these students have full-time jobs, um, they're not paying for the internet service. They're not paying for the Xbox. They're not paying for the PlayStation. So if they're not going to utilize it appropriately, those privileges can be taken away. So we have a question is, uh, someone has asked, I don't know, um, how to limit the internet and how to block sites. Is there a good website that would explain how to do that types of browsers, those kinds of things? What would you recommend if they want to do that? Where should they get started? Well, um, first of all, this resource, any one of these four resources, um, especially the Connect Safely, if you write that down, you can have to go to that. It will tell you how to set up parental controls. I'm not sure. Uh, they're referring to like online gaming or just referring to like YouTube or something like that. Um, but these four resources, in addition to even if it's just like Xbox, PlayStation, if you literally Google uh, parental controls for Xbox 360, for example, or PlayStation 4, it'll walk you step by step how to set it up. So you said that you have a, a Internet contract with your with family members in your family. Correct? Is that what you had said? Or you're, did they I have, have, a, I have, a, I have a contract, I have an internet safety contract and I have a school contract with my son. Is the school contract something that you wrote or was that something that the school had given a template for? No, it's, it's something that I wrote. I pretty much uh, <clears throat> came up with a contract based on this is his, this is his job, his job is to be a student. These are my expectations. Um, and this is, what we're going to agree upon. You're going to, you know, study, you know, you're going to maintain a certain GPA. You're going to go to bed at a certain time. Um, you're responsible for, you know, getting your clothes out, so forth and so on. And if he violates that contract, then it's possible. Okay. Yeah. Um, someone said that they don't have parental control access on their child's Chromebook as it's set by school. They want to know, is there a way they could get uh, access to parental control? I know that there might be a little since it's a school issued one, but you might know since you do work in the schools a little bit. Right. I can answer that. So my son has a Chromebook through school as well, and he has a personal Chromebook. You can contact the IT department or whoever's in charge of IT at the school. Um, and you can find out what parental controls are already set up because the school should have automatically set up certain parental controls on the Chromebook. And if you feel like um, you want additional parental controls or you just want to inquire about how to monitor it yourself, reach out to them. That would be the resource that can, can definitely help you. That's what I've done with my son's uh, Chromebook because it is controlled by the school. Oh, yeah. so they said they did contact the school. They told me just monitor your child, which is not easy. So if it's something I know that if it's, a, it's an issued device, they don't necessarily want you to have control above what they have because then you could reverse engineer that do you have do you have any other advice you know if they can't add software and other than having some sort of contract do you have any other recommendations for helping encourage them to you know I, I make better do. choices i do I, I think my my advice would be once they come home from school if they don't need to utilize that device for school work where they can literally sit with you next to you or in front of you or somewhere in a public area within the home then don't let them use the Chromebook. If they're not utilizing it for school-related activity, then take it away from them. I have a rule, and I, I'll put it out there. I have a rule with, with my son, and this is, I mean, but this is more personal. It's not necessarily like a police-related thing. <clears throat> but I have a rule with him Monday through Thursday. 
there's no additional screen time. So his Chromebook for school, when he comes home, if he needs it to study for a test or something like that, he has to do it at a dining room table, kitchen table, where I can see what he's doing. If he's not utilizing it to study or do some additional homework, there's no screen time, no video games. He doesn't own it. He's 11, he's gonna be 12 this year. He doesn't have a cell phone. Um, he has a personal Chromebook that he does not utilize throughout the week. He can come home, he can read, he can play video, or not play videos, he can read, play his Legos if he has some downtime, he can draw, um, but he doesn't get additional screen time. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, um, my rule based on the contract is this. You can play, you can have as much screen time as you would like. There's a catch to it. So let's say on Friday night, he says, Daddy, I would like to play, I'm just going to throw out a game, Roblox. If he wants to play Roblox, have at it. If he plays Roblox for two hours, let's just say, before he can touch a device that has a screen again, he has to give me two hours of academic enrichment. Math, reading, science, project, I will give him work to do. Um, so he pretty much monitors, or not even monitors, he pretty much uh, polices himself, so to speak. He does not ask to play video games for two hours. He does not ask to play his Nintendo Switch hardly ever. He just naturally will go and read a book or play with his Legos and different things. And I think it's just because he's accustomed to that. I've never allowed him to um, just spend so much time in front of a screen. As there's obviously about the sites, um, has there been anything more that now that more young adults have cell phones? That, has there been any change of patterns there? Cause you know, children are younger, younger when they're getting that from their family. Has there been any new things that you've noticed coming around with them searching or, you know, bullying through phones, which we know is definitely increased a lot over time now that younger and younger people can have access to their own cell phones. No, I don't, I don't know of anything. I mean, obviously the bullying through the cell phones and bullying online is, is an issue and will continue to be an issue. I just think one of the things I teach programs and I teach at the high school is just, uh, I wouldn't say it's an issue, but just the lack of personal interaction among students. Literally, the moment a teacher stops talking, all you see is heads down into the cell phones. Like, they don't even converse amongst each other. It's a, literally, they're just straight into an app, you know, whether it's Instagram or TikTok. And um, they're truly addicted to it. It's amazing. Um, the one thing I would encourage you to do for those that have tuned in is look at uh, The Social Dilemma. Uh, there's a, a, a documentary called The Social Dilemma. I would encourage you to, to look at that and you know, some agrees, you know, different people have different perspectives on it, but at least, you know, take a look at it and, and determine, um, you know, how you want to go about, you know, utilizing social media in terms of raising your, your child or your children. Well, I'm sorry, Melissa, what I just want to say is one of the interesting things I feel about the social dilemma is that at the very end, the, the individuals that Melissa just mentioned that help create these social media platforms don't even allow their own children to utilize these social media platforms because they understand the dangers within being addicted to it, so. Um, a person says, my 10 year old son says all his friends play online after school and by him not playing during the week, I have limited him having friends. Any advice? Um, sure, um, I can only tell you from my personal experience, I have one son <laughs> and he's 11 <clears throat> and he's my only child. And he goes to school and I pick him up around 5.30 after I finish work. He has from 8 in the morning when I drop him off to 5, 5.30 in the afternoon to interact with his, with his friends, quote unquote friends. Now, I don't like that term friends personally. I don't like to use it loosely because I feel like <clears throat> uh, these kids use the term friend to just mean their classmate or their peers. Um, but if they truly have friends, their friends should have their best interests at heart and should really understand that the goal, that, that the goal for my son, I'm just going to speak personally for 11 year old, his goal is to be the best student that he can be. His primary goal for going to school is to get an education. There's two components to school. There's an academic component, as we all know, and there's a social component. That's just part of it. So he has an opportunity to have some uh, social time with his peers. And when I pick him up at 530 and he comes home, it's time to get any homework done, 
It's time to study. It's time to get your things ready for the next day. It's time to do some chores, some dishes to be done, folds, uh, clothes to be folded. It's time to refocus, recalibrate, to get ready for the next day. So uh, from six approximately to eight o'clock, he goes to bed at 8.30. Those two, two and a half, three hours, let's just say max, is for him to get himself together for the next day so that he can continue to be the best student that he can be. He needs rest um, and he needs to continue to, uh, to grind, you know? So for me, I, I don't know, I can't really tell you. Um, it hasn't been an issue for me personally. He has, I mean, how many hours is that? From eight to five, I mean, that's nine hours. <laughs> I appreciate your time, Officer Wright. I know that this is a very fraught and con in some ways constantly changing thing because the internet and all of social media has changed so much and it can change very quickly. So like TikTok didn't exist a few years back and now it's a very big part of things. And that one's definitely a more public facing some of the options compared to the previous more one-on-one -on -one kind of contacting apps for people. So I know yeah. that it can yeah. be very stressful. So other than these resources, what if they want to reach out to community policing if they have questions for you? Um, how can they reach out to you or if you know any other resources, maybe you know, you know the right department if they wanted to talk to someone in the schools, anything you can share? Uh, if you want to reach out to myself, um, you can reach out to me at communitypolicing at ebpd.net. That's communitypolicing at ebpd.net. Uh, that's the way to reach out to uh, myself. And in regards to the school, whatever school that your child or your children go to, um, obviously, you can reach out to them if you just obviously, you know, put their name into uh, Google into the search engine, reach out to one of the school administrators, they'll be happy to um, reach out to you to answer any questions that you will have. Um, I will also say that I do a distracted driver presentation for teams in the high school, and I think this also pertains to internet safety. It's called um, uh, Share the Keys. And essentially, the whole premise for Share the Keys is to try to get these teenagers to understand that the number one cause of death amongst teen amongst teenagers is distracted driving. Um, it's the number one way that teens die. Um, it's also the number one way that teens get uh, seriously injured, uh, whether it's injure themselves or injure others. And I think the same principle applies to internet safety. I think it's important as parents, guardians, and caregivers um, to let our children know that again, it is a privilege. It is a privilege to be able to utilize the internet and I understand that it's utilized in school and that's necessary, you know, based on today's times for kids to get education. But outside of that, anything extracurricular um, is something that they need to understand that this is literally a privilege that's provided to them. It's not their right. But again, that's, you know, it goes back to choices. And I try to tell kids in one of the curriculums that I teach that um, you need to set goals. And then in order to reach your goals, which obviously, you know, for these students, their goal should be to get education. You have to make responsible decisions and your decisions have consequences. So if you make a good decision, it will yield a positive consequence. If you make a bad decision, it could yield a negative consequence. And regards to like Melissa just said that, you know, students often say, well, everyone's doing it. My friends are doing it. That's an emotional response. And I always tell kids our emotions affect our decisions and our decisions affect our goals. So what is the best decision in terms of being on the internet online gaming, et cetera, if you literally have a goal. Um, so my advice would be to make sure kids understand that their primary goal is to get education and uh, that we need to support them in doing so. And the internet is a very useful tool. It's a useful resource that can be used, um, but if it's not used properly, um, it can create a lot of damage as well um, for our children and for, uh, for our, within our community as well. So, you know, just try to help you know, try to help your children make responsible decisions, um, especially with the internet. Can it, it can be devastating if they post pictures or, you know, if they're trying to bully someone or if someone's bullying them. Um, it can have a, a traumatic effect on them in terms of their emotional well-being. I was going to say, like, and lastly, like, I think the peer influence is, is something that we have to be mindful of. Like, you know, one of the things I talk to the students about, I mean, less than five of, of the curriculum that I teach for fifth graders in the East Brunswick uh, Public School is um, the friendship qualities. You want to make sure you choose some friends based on healthy qualities. So you want to choose some friends that if they're using the internet, they're using the internet properly. 
um, so that you guys can hold each other accountable. You know, you don't want to have, uh, you know, you want to try to monitor who your kids are talking to online, who they're texting, who they're interacting with, because oftentimes if they pick up these negative behaviors or go on these, on these websites, it's because they got that information from a peer, someone that's close to them. So really try to be mindful um, and diligent about knowing who they're spending time with and who's in their ear. Um, I always tell my son this, and I think this pertains to internet safety as well as so many other things in life. I always say, you show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Um, so just be mindful of who their friends are um, because that's going to have a tremendous impact in regards to their future. Okay, it doesn't seem that we have any other questions, but um, as Officer Wright said, you can reach him at communitypolicing at ebpd.net. Uh, he definitely responds, or some of his colleagues do, and there, he covers other topics other than internet safety, and he can help you connect to resources if you need that. So thank you so much again, Officer Wright, and thank you everyone else for attending. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Hope everyone has a good night.